Still muted. There, there we go. Can you hear me now? Yep. <laughs> All kinds of technical difficulties tonight. I know. <laughs> I know. Right on. How's things? Not bad. You? Good. Busy. Busy still? Yep. The Northern's this weekend, so I'll be pretty... Right. It'll be a good feeling when it's all done. It's been a lot of work, but it's exciting. Yeah. Um, have you had much action online so far? Like, has the auction been open already? I haven't looked. Yep. Yeah, yeah, it is open. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's all been live and bids are happening. And yeah, it's exciting. Good. I think it might. Good, good. Cra crazy enough, it could work. <laughs> oh, well, hopefully. I think people are adapting well to new things right and yeah uh, yeah we'll see yeah. it's uh it's been pretty good lots of good local support still so good good right. yeah it's not nearly as fun as having the actual event and no. like you know you get some alcohol in people and yeah. <laughs> they, they get more generous yeah it's a good time for yeah. sure um good. what else are you working on um well, I was chatting with Caleb yesterday. We're still fighting the Toshodi battle. Um, and I'm just doing some final reports for my other projects or starting to do analysis and final reports for the other projects. So it's pretty steady. Good. Right on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess uh, we'll do a quick introduction. I'm Josh Hamilton, director of the Wild Sheep Society of BC. And this is Alicia Woods. I'll let her introduce herself. But what we're going to present today is uh, our burn project that we've been working on for the past few years and kind of where it's led to and yeah, what we're at now. Go ahead. Sure. Sounds good. Um, I'll share my screen here. How does that look? Can you see it there? Yep. And give us a little introduction to yourself. Too. No, I can't see your screen. Yeah. Pardon me? I can't, I, we can't see your screen. You can or you can't? Cannot. Okay. Give me a second. <laughs> there you go. There you we're, we're, There we go. Now we're cooking with gas. Okay, so like Josh said, my name is Alicia Woods. I'm a wildlife biologist based here in Fort St. John. And I've um, been doing this for about 20 years. I worked with the Ministry of Environment and FLNRO for a few years as a regional biologist. And during that time, I started running the prescribed burn program that government ran. And now as a consulting biologist, I'm doing the same thing for guys like uh, Wild Sheep Society BC and also for other groups, um, First Nations, as well as the local rod and gun club. And so today, Josh has asked me just to do a short presentation on the program and the burn program that we've started up and kind of what it's all about, where we're at. And um, yeah, looking for some comments and questions and whatever we can uh, do to get you guys interested and get some support for this project. So prescribed fire, what is it? Um, it's, we've been using prescribed fire for a long time. First Nations have done it for centuries. Uh, guide outfitters have done it quite a, for at least a, a few decades here in the piece. Ranchers use it lots on range tenures to promote forage for their stock. And it's also been used for wildlife management. And specifically here in the Northeast, prescribed fire has been used a lot over the last several decades. Uh, fire can be used as a natural management tool when it's done in a controlled and targeted method. So there are other ways you can do habitat management and in some areas of the province where you have high values, for example, there's um, transportation corridors, you've got cities, you've got towns and um, homes and rural properties, prescribed fire might not be the best tool um, because of the risk. But in the Northeast, being able to use a tool like fire, which is a natural mechanism, um, sure beats out other mechanical type treatments. So like I said, in the Northeast, we've been using fire for a long time for wildlife management. Um, between 1970 and 
1990s, we did a lot of conversion burns. And what conversion burns are is where we would light fires in mature timbered forests um, to convert them to an early serial stage. Um, and back in those days, we had, or the government had two programs. One was the Elk Habitat Enhancement Program, which really ran from like the Graham all the way up through to the Stone Mountain kind of area and all those Eastern foothills, a lot of slopes and ridges were burned and converted from spruce stands to early cereal stands to really enhance elk in the region. Similarly, the province also ran a stone sheep enhancement program. Um, and this was focused more in the Kachika area. And again, um, quite a few years ago now. And same thing, trying to expand sheep range and increase habitat. After the 1990s, we started moving into more of a goal of maintaining habitat, not creating new habitat. And so with this, instead of converting stands, they would just maintain the existing burned areas by burning more often and repeated to keep it in an early serial state to keep the grassland going. Um, and then since 2015, um, there has been no province-led prescribed burns in the piece. Um, we did one project with, in partnership with the Wild Sheep Society of BC back in 2017, which was a completely stakeholder-led prescribed burn project in the Toshodi River area. Um, but since 2015, government hasn't done any habitat management in the Northeast. So what does fire do? In our region, what it really does is it creates and maintains grassland and shrubland ecosystems. It keeps back that forest encroachment. So in the piece especially, we have a lot of aspen and aspen can be very weedy and it can take over without fire to keep it back. Um, and as you know, like in the prairies too, wildfire was a constant mechanism as part of the environment that uh, would be used to maintain those grasslands. And without fire, you start to lose those ecosystems. The other thing that fire does is creates a post-fire nutrient flush. So when things burn, you end up with this ash on the ground, like you can see in this photo. And what it does is it releases nutrients into the soil and causes the vegetation to really like rebound and flush and it's green and it grows fast and it's more nutritious. More nutritious. So not only do you get more vegetation post-fire, it's thicker, it's also more nutritional in that you have greater crude protein, which is beneficial for the animals. Fire will also remove down woody debris. Uh, so old trees that have fallen down, um, especially in old burns where the ground is just littered with big stumps and logs and it's hard for animals to pass through. Uh, the other thing that burning really does is it just removes that stagnant matted ve vegetation. So um, if you've lived in the Peace in Northeast BC, um, you'll know that in the spring you can often see people burning ditches, burning their lawns. Um, a colleague of mine from a few years ago used, didn't grow up here but worked here for a few years and I remember him saying uh, it's just in people's blood in this part. Everyone just lights fires in the spring. And um, a lot of it is, is, you know, you light the fire on your lawn and it removes all that old stuff that you'd be raking up and just promotes that really flush green grass coming back. So how does fire benefit wildlife? So there's several things it does. It increases the amount of forage, like I just said with the biomass, it increases the quality of forage. So the new vegetation that comes back after a burn is higher in digestibility. So it's easier for the animals to digest. It has greater crude protein. So that increases the nutrition for the animals as well. It increases their line of sight. So by removing that thick regrowth of aspen or really thick tall shrubs, um, it allows the animals to see and detect predators more. Um, I know we've all bushwhacked through old aspen cut blocks and you can't see five feet in front of yourself. So um, by doing these burns, it opens it up so that the predators or so that the animals can detect predators and not just when they're right on them. It also increases movement through the habitat. So um, a lot of the wildfires will of course knock down trees and then it becomes a bit of a jungle. And there's 
movement barriers, basically. It's hard for animals to move through. It makes them more susceptible to predation, um, especially when there's lots of blowdown. Um, it's a lot easier for wolves to jump over logs to get at a moose or an elk, which is having a hard time fumbling through that type of blowdown. With wildlife, we really focus with the burns on winter range. So with the winter range, well, in most wildlife, the most critical period and important period for wildlife is the, win the late winter season. So at this point, they're in poor body condition. They've used up all their fat reserves. The females are pregnant and everyone's just sort of living on that line and forage is poor. Um, snow has crusted, which makes it harder for them to get at the forage. It requires more energy expenditure. So by doing the winter range and improving the forage on the winter range, we're really targeting exactly what we want to improve wildlife health when they're at their worst condition. Uh, usually our winter ranges in the Northeast for all our ungulates are south or west facing slopes, usually steep. Um, the reason for this is they have low snow loads. They get that solar radiation from the sun. So it keeps the snowpack down. Also the snow disappears quicker in late March and April and things green up faster. So again, if you live in the peace, the, the peace breaks are always the first to green up. And if you want to escape the snow, um, go to the breaks and that's where you'll see all the animals in March and April, especially. And the same goes with all our, our mountain ungulates as well. They focus on the south facing slopes. <laughs> there you go. Okay, so how does burning help specifically for sheep? So an old biologist told me once that it doesn't take a lot to make a sheep happy. Compared to an elk, they need lots of forage, bigger ranges. Sheep, they need quality over quantity. And with sheep, it's all about location. They need burns close to escape terrain, um, rugged areas where they can easily eat. And then if predators come, they can jump onto that escape terrain. Um, unlike elk, which are a bigger animal, more of a herd animal, it, they have different techniques, of course, for evading predation. But with sheep, it really is being tied to that escape terrain. So you really, one of the main key things with burning for sheep is that they, those burns have to be by escape terrain. Similar to other ungulates, again, they're south and west facing slopes. Um, the other thing with sheep is that they need to be frequent burns. So Krista Sittler, Kathy Parker, and Mike Gillingham of UNBC found um, working in the Northeast on prescribed burns that sheep really require the frequent burns because they want that quality forage. So that higher digestibility, that nu nutrition that comes post fire, that's what sheep really go to. Um, but unfortunately after a fire, about five years after the fire, the vegetation quality goes back down to what it was pre-burn levels. So in order to keep really good habitat for sheep, we need to do frequent burns. And what their research actually shows was that anywhere between five to 10 years, sheep range should be burned every five to 10 years at most to make sure that forage stays um, at good quality for the sheep. High elevation areas, again, uh, adjacent to this escape terrain, keeping them high elevation to also uh, decrease interaction and competition with other ungulates, specifically elk. So, so I, this is how we do it. Um, unfortunately, it's not as easy as throwing a match. Um, back in the good old days, everyone used to just th walk out of the mountains with a Bic lighter and light along as they went. Um, you know, lots of outfitters used to have these Molotov cocktail things that they chuck out of fixed wings and light burning, <laughs> light burns that way. Um, but nowadays, uh, of course, it's a lot more technical and not so uh, easy to do. So the process starts with site selection. Um, like we just talked about in the last slide for sheep, it's making sure you pick the right site to burn. We don't want to burn that's going to create issues or problems or create like what we call a sink habitat for sheep that we draw them into an area that's actually going to be worse off for them. Then we also want to look at burn objectives. So what species are we burning for sheep or are we burning for elk or are we burning for moose? What type of habitat are we burning and what type of 
fern do we need to achieve our goal and our habitat that we're looking for? So with moose, for example, the type of burn we'd need is very different in order to stimulate shrub growth uh, to get that new shrubs for them to eat because they're a browser as opposed to sheep where we want more of the herbs and the grasses. Um, and so that means a different type of burn. And some of the considerations too, so we do spring burns and almost all the burns in the Northeast have always been spring burns. And the main reason for that being if that we do a fall burn, for example, sometimes it can be a bit safer because you're going into winter. So your chance of, es uh, of escape in a prolonged issue with the fire, of course, is lower because you're going into the winter. But the problem with fall burns for ungulates is that you remove all their winter forage. So like we talked about earlier, in that it's really important that we have good forage for the animals in late March and April. Well, if we burn that in September and October, there's nothing for them um, come that late winter. So it's actually a real detriment. So for ungulate burns and for winter range, spring burns are the best time to do it. At that point too, you've got frost in the ground. So the surface material is dry, it's crunchy, and it easily lights on fire and can sustain up a fire, but it's not so hot Odd that it's scorching the soils. And I've spoken with lots of uh, elders and First Nations around the region, and they've all said the same thing, that they always do the burns in the spring because the frost is in the ground. Um, and so that's, again, another reason why we do spring burns. We have to make sure we have the right fuel on the ground. So there has to be enough vegetation to sustain a fire. If the slope has been heavily grazed and it looks like a lawn, it's not going to sustain a fire hot enough to do what we want it to. Um, that fuel or that grass also has to be dry enough. If it's too damp, it also won't burn well. Weather conditions, again, we need lower humidities, um, good temperatures around 20 degrees. You don't want it too hot. You don't want it too cold. We have to make sure we have the right winds from the right direction. And again, it can't be too windy making sure we have proper fire breaks around the burn polygon. So in the mountains, a lot of what we use are natural fire breaks. So things like cliffs, wet draws. So in the spring, usually the north facing slopes still hold snow. Um, so that's a natural fire break um, as well as yeah, rocks and, and cliffs and areas where there's low fuel. We use what we call an aerial ignition device. And so you can see that um, here with me in the helicopter. And what it does is you feed these ping pong balls in to the machine and the ping pong balls have potassium permanganate in them. And when they're fed into the machine, there's little needles that inject them with glycol. And that glycol and potassium permanganate have a chemical reaction. And in about 30 seconds after they're dropped from the machine downwards, um, they combust. And so depending on the speed of the helicopter when we're flying, these balls are dropped and then you get this sort of nice line of ignition sources. And then as they start to burn and cons consume fuel, it'll move up slope and start to join into one fire line. So it does take usually thousands of ping pong balls required, um, but luckily they're light and they're fairly easy to, to pack around. <laughs> you can stuff a lot in a helicopter. <laughs> um, after the burn is done. And so burns usually are really short term events. You light them, they burn for a couple hours, they move up slope, they run out of fuel, they run into the rocks, they run into snow, and then they go out. Um, and then for a few days afterwards, we monitor the burns by going and flying them, making sure there's no hot spots that have like where the burn has dug in, say into root wads or um, into the ground. And if that, if those are there, then we have to action that um, putting crews on it to put those out so that they don't linger and we run into trouble later on in the summer. So after we do the burning, we're looking for a few different results. We want to make sure we get the right intensity of fire, that it was hot enough to do what we wanted it to do, that it was in the right spot, <laughs> and that it consumed our fuel. Um, if our burn was successful, we'll have greater biomass, so there's more food for the wildlife, and it's better nutritional quality. So we end up with good habitat, we end up with healthier animals, we hopefully have stable populations, and we have decreased predation risk. So all of this equates to some very happy sheep. 
So this is a short video that I'll just play you. So this is some burning that we did in the Toshodi a few years ago. So I think it's only about 30 seconds. So this shows um, when we've, we've started the light up and the fire, the balls have now joined and you can see this fire line that's creating and then you're getting convective forces that are sucking that fire up the mountain. And um, that's really what um, keeps that fire going. So I'll just turn this on here. So that was just a little example of, um, yeah, one of the fires we did, this was for sheep. And um, you can sort of see on the bottom end here, you get that fire line. And what that fire will do over the rest of the day is it'll start to creep downhill and just burning, slowly burning up the fuels until it burns itself out, or it gets down into these lower areas here where there's usually snow in the trees because it's still May and it's wet and it's cold and the fire will just work its way out. Okay, so the prescribed burn project that the Wild Sheep Society of BC has started, um, really it was driven by a lack of recent habitat management in sheep ranges. So um, government hasn't done a lot over the past few years and especially over the past 30 years, there's been some areas in sheep range that haven't been treated at all and have had no habitat management. Like I said, we had some success in 2017 in the Toshodi, we burned 1200 hectares of sheep habitat. So that was really great. Um, the program goal really is to restore, maintain and enhance sheep habitat. So by restore, I mean where there was habitat, it's not great, it's not supporting sheep anymore. Let's burn that, bring it back. Maintain, meaning we've got habitat there, it's occupied by sheep, it's still being used. We just need to refresh it to get that nutritional quality to come back. And when I say enhance, what I mean there is maybe let's create more habitat or expand populations by expanding and creating some more sheep winter range. So we have 11 um, proposed burns for this year uh, to happen this spring in May. The objectives again are to provide high quality forage reduce encroachment of aspen, uh, improve line of sight, increase spatial separation from elk and adjacent to escape terrain. So here you can see that top arrow is um, the encroachment of aspen. So this is at one of our vegetation plots and you can see that the aspen and the poplar are starting to grow in and that will slowly choke out the grass and the herbs on the ground, which is what the key forage is for the sheep. This photo on the bottom right here is um, one of our vegetation plots again, and you can see a black and white pole there. Um, that pole's about five foot six, and you can see that you can hardly see five feet of it. And that sh those shrubs are really thick, really impossible to move through. Um, and so you can sort of imagine yourself being a sheep trying to move through there to detect predators, to get away from predators, and also to find what little vegetation is underneath there. And like I said earlier, location, location, location. And you can see we've burned here on this bottom left photo adj adjacent to this escape terrain. And this just makes it so great for the sheep to be able to hop down, have a munch, and then get right back up. They don't have to go too far. They don't have to put themselves at predation risk to get to good quality forage. So we have 11 sites proposed for this May. They're all in Region 7B or the Northeast. This year we focused on stone sheep, but we are planning over the next few years to try to start to expand in bighorn sheep areas in the southernmost part of the region. So these photos also show um, just sort of examples of what our sites look like um, here. This is a perfect photo on this bottom left about you've got the escape train up top 
And it's all these little ridges, sometimes I call them fingers, that come down. And this is what the sheep really like. They'll come off the rocks, come down and forage, and then go back up. These are really nice sites to burn as well, because as you can tell, your risk of escape is really low. That fire burns right up into the rocks and stops. It's got nowhere else to go. Uh, similarly here, you can see all this green stuff, um, which the sheep like. The nice thing about prescribed burning and especially using the AIDS machine is that we can be very selective. And so with this site down here on the bottom right, you can run a fire line about mid slope. And like I said, they, that fire line will start to creep downhill, but it won't burn these patches. It'll run into wet, cold ground and it'll stop. Um, so naysayers of burning might say you're just wiping out everything but because fire is such a natural mechanism it actually creates quite a mosaic it's not all just burnt like you might see in a wildfire so this is one of our our sites again and the arrows here just show what what areas we're going to be targeting um, in the foreground there you can see the type of vegetation that we're hoping to uh, um, achieve some low shrubs, lots of herbs and grasses for the sheep to, to eat. Here's an example of winter range. Um, these little south facing bits are what we're burning. Um, so on these north facing slopes, you can sort of see all this spruce is here. In the spring, those have snow, it won't burn. We could try, but it won't. So what we do is you light these and these little patches just do a world of good for the sheep. Again, they don't need much. It just needs to be in the right location. So we can also achieve spatial separation. So this is an example of an area where we've got sheep and we've got elk. Um, and you can't really see the bottom of the photo, but this is a drainage where it's, it's an ungulate layer cake is what I like to call it. Up top here, we have sheep, we've got goats. And then you end up with this sort of middle bench that isn't burned, it's untouched, creates some spatial sep separation. And then down here below is lower slopes along the river and that's where the elk really should be. And so by using burning in a specific location, i.e. these high elevation slopes, and these fingers, we give sheep habitat. And then in a perfect world, we'd wanna do similar burning down low here for the elk as well to give them habitat. So those are examples of where the, the fire would be applied for sheep. Another example of one of our sites that we're planning on doing this spring. This is what this is a good photo that shows what we expect to see. Um, so first of all, you have the black stuff <laughs> that's been burnt and this will come out um, or come back real quick. Like, Sometimes within days, if we, after we get a nice hot burn like that, if we get a little bit of rain and a little bit of sun, that forage comes back so fast and so green. And we've seen sheep move in within days to munch on all those little sprigs that are just starting to come up. You can also see that what we've achieved with this burn is we've killed some of the aspen. Um, and that will slowly start to increase the amount of forage on the ground. But you, can, but you can also see that we haven't burnt everything. There's still some aspen and some spruce that are alive and they'll stay alive. So you, again, you get that patchwork. This is an example of a burn that I, we did oh, about 10, 15 years ago. And this photo was taken in July, beginning of July, and that site was burnt mid-May. So in six to seven weeks, that vegetation grew about two feet and it's lush and it's thick. It was just, it was an impressive response to fire in that site. Um, I wish I had like a person in there for visual reference, um, but you can see also that we achieved the objective of killing back the, the, atch, the aspen and the birch and the willow with back here that was burnt hot enough that it's killed it now. And then this type of vegetation, you'll start to take see take over into here. So another big part of the project is effectiveness monitoring. So what I mean by that is we look at how, how our burns are, or are our burns achieving what we want them to achieve? So this has become a requirement by the Ministry of Forest Lands, Natural Resource Operations and Rural Development, as well as the Habitat Conservation Trust Foundation. So 
in order to get permits, government is wanting to see some pretreatment effectiveness monitoring and then monitoring after the burn to show if, if we achieved what we said we were gonna achieve. Um, so this unfortunately can be a really expensive part of the project, but because it is a requirement to not only get permits, but also to get funding from people like HCTF, it's become a necessary part of burn programs. In July, 2020, we completed um, monitoring on four of the sites that are proposed for burning in 2021. And the purpose of the monitoring is really to look at vegetation response, um, pre and post burn and on control sites, changes in wildlife use. So how much wildlife was on there before, how much was on it afterwards, um, changes in wildlife health. And I'll talk about that next slide. And then recruitment. So how many lambs are surviving to 10 months, 11 months of age on burns and not on burns? Are we actually increasing the ability of lambs to survive? We compare pretreatment and post-treatment, and then we also look at control or untreated sites. To do this, we have set up vegetation plots where we measure the, or can, can identify all the species present on site, as well as percent covers, um, height, we also look at wildlife transects, which are along the slope as well. And along transects, we look at and document wildlife signs. So pellet groupings, hair, browse, digs, trails. Um, we're using a new method that I've never used before for monitoring burns. And we're putting up trail and wide angle time-lapse cameras. And so again, this is another method to um, enumerate use of the burns by wildlife pre and post. We also have aerial recruitment surveys planned. And so we do these late March um, to measure the, or count the number of lambs that have survived through to their almost one year of life. And what we would expect to see is that post burn for a few years after the burn, we would like to see lamb recruitment be higher, um, assuming that the burns create more nutritious forage and provide better habitat for them during that critical period. And we're also going to be do, doing some pellet sample collection. And so the pellet sample collection, as well as the wildlife health indicators that I was speaking about, are as a result of a partnership that we formed with the University of Northern British Columbia and Dr. Heather Bryan. And so what we're really looking at here is we want to investigate the effects of habitat that's been treated with fire on ungulate health, physiology, and recruitment. So there's been lots of research out there, especially in the Northeast, that have shown um, how sheep and elk use burns, how they move to burns, what seasons they use burns. Um, there's been a whole bunch of research done in the States as well on um, the nutritional quality of vegetation and um, how, how, yeah, how it can benefit wildlife. One of the gaps, information gaps, is we don't know exactly how um, the burns affect wildlife health in specifically. So what we're going to look at is by collecting fresh pellet samples and urine samples, we can look at hormone levels of sheep and we can look at parasites and other physiological measures. We can even look at pregnancy rates um, to really get a handle on if burning is improving their health. And so we're hoping to bring on a graduate student to work on this part of the project, um, but it's a great partnership to be able to have with UNBC and to really contribute to the overall research around burns. Um, I don't think there's any negatives associated with this. The more information we can gather about the benefits of burns, um, the more support we get for continuing to do these, these types of treatments on the land base. The process. <laughs> this has become, yeah, getting doing prescribed burns has become quite the process. So securing funding is the first step and that seems to be the easiest thing these days. Um, then we conduct some pretreatment effectiveness monitoring. Uh, we have to complete the paperwork is, is a really big part of the project and I found this nice little cartoon here, Josh, which is me drowning in paper on my desk <laughs> while we put together like burn that. plans. So 
yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's like plan Z, I think, in there somewhere. And so, um, yeah, really, it's become quite laborious in that for each burn polygon, we have to do an impact assessment. We look do a value analysis. So a lot of this is taking geospatial layers on the computer, laying every value and data that we can over top of our burn polygons to find out what's in that burn polygon that we could potentially be impacting. Um, we have to list these out, provide mitigation measures on how we're going to mitigate the impacts or um, if there's things we can do to not create cause these impacts. Uh, we also have to do biological ra rationale, which again is um, digging through a lot of the literature to support why burns are so great for the wildlife again. And then finally, we do a burn prescription, which goes to the BC Wildfire Service, which says, this is how we're going to do it. This is the type of weather and metrics that we want to see when we're doing it. This is the timing. Um, and then that's for, for their decision. So after we've done all of that, it goes to FLNRO and BC Parks and or BC Parks when the burn is in a park. Um, so the, they go and review it. That's been quite a lengthy process so far. Um, then if government decides that they're okay with the burns, then they put them into First Nations consultation. Um, and then depending on the comments that they get back from the consultation, they um, will make changes or ask us to make changes. And then so finally, we need to try and secure our permits and approvals, which even through steps one through six, we, there's no guarantee that we're going to get our approvals at the end of all of that. Finally, number eight, we get to implement the burns and then nine being that post-treatment monitoring. So our progress to date, in April this year, we drafted sites, sent them to FLNO sort of for a preliminary uh, look to make sure there was no red flags and that the sites that we selected were in fact good sites for sheep. We received support in principle from FLNRO back in July. Uh, we con conducted our pre-treatment monitoring. Between August and October, we um, developed the prescriptions, did all the paperwork part of it, We've been engaging with First Nations basically from the get-go and um, having them involved as much as we can during the prescription development as well. In October, we submitted the burn plans and prescriptions to FLNRO and BC Parks, and they're currently under review. So our feedback to date in that the burn plans have passed through the caribou team's review, which is a good thing. And they're currently being reviewed by the rest of the branches within FLNRO and BC Parks. One of the things that we really wanted to mention too is that we've received some amazing support from all the First Nations. Um, they're all very supportive of prescribed burns for wildlife. They all see the benefit of it. And um, we've even had some of the First Nations come out and help us with some of the groundwork um, doing cameras and that too. So it's really great to see their support and wanting to be involved in these projects. Um, it's just, it's really an important component of these projects to make sure they're successful as well. So our next steps. Um, right now we're waiting for government to get some comments back to us and to see if there's anything that we need to address, um, concerns that they may have. February, we're going to order ping pong balls. And then this late March, April, we're gonna be doing our first pre-treatment recruitment survey. And so we're gonna be looking at counting sheep, classifying sheep in the areas where our burns are planned, as well as a control area, control population where we don't have burns planned and probably won't have burns planned for the next five years so that we can really compare what recruitment looks like in areas with burns and areas without burns. Um, in March, we'll find out about our funding applications to HCTF and whether we get money from them to continue on with the project. And then hopefully by May, we should have some permit approvals in hand. So that's all I've got. <laughs> I really wanna th say thanks to all our supporters. So the Habitat Conservation Trust Foundation has been a strong supporter of the project. We have money from them for this year and we've applied for funding again for next year for the project to continue on. 
the Wild Shape Society of BC is an awesome supporter of this project and really the driver behind it. The Wild Sheep Foundation has provided funds to us to do the recruitment survey. Uh, UNBC and Dr. Heather Bryan have contributed some funds to purchase cameras. Backcountry here in Fort St. John gave us cameras at a reduced cost. And Jason Palfi at River Jet Adventures was great and put some, brought some fuel up on, with his riverboat um, so that we didn't have to haul it in via helicopter. So really appreciate everyone's support for this and um, yeah, yeah it's glad great. that so many people are behind it. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's pretty good. I think if I can add anything to the end, it'd be, uh, there's so many positives that have come out of the development of this project really too. Like it's been, it's been a learning process for all of us to try to reestablish, you know, fire as that management tool, but uh, some of the collaborations we've been able to make and just the design of this new, like we all knew that it was going to take more to be able to get the fire done. But I think when we're looking at a project of this scale across Northeast BC, and we're really trying to keep that continuous wild sheep habitat actually continuous that, you know, we had to do our due diligence and we had to build the rationale. Um, and I think, I think, I think, uh, I think we really have something here now and uh, it's going to be great to see a multi-year project come together like this for the for the for the outcomes that come out, out of it that could provide information for the future as well as benefiting the wildlife now so it's awesome thank you for your all your help uh it's been it's been great working with you i know you've been the like the diagram of the stack of books like it has been <laughs> so beating our heads against the wall sometimes back to the drawing board but that's what it takes right um yeah yeah i think i think i think we pretty much covered everything else in there um like I said, it's just such a key management tool. What do you think, like when we talk about spatial separation, we talk about climate change, uh, we talk about Musquaka Chica, what do you really think uh, for like prescribed fire? Can we design it so that we can maintain the species that we have now uh, in abundance without huge confliction to certain species like caribou or others? Yeah, I really do. I think so. Um, and that's the joy of prescribed burns is that we can apply them where we want to apply them to get the benefits that we want. So um, wildfires, for example, they are going to come in the middle of the summer and it's going to be destructive and it's going to be large scale where when you do prescribed fires, it's in a controlled fashion and we can be very selective as to what's burned for what species. And, you know, there's such a long history of burning in the Muskwaka Chica and in our parks. And really, you know, the Northern Rockies, the Bessa Prophet, the Muskwaka Chica, all those were designated because of the diversity that are with the wildlife diversity that are in these parks and the ecosystem diversity. Um, you guys have all heard that the Northeast is often referred to as the Serengeti of the North. And that is in large part due to the burning that has happened over the past 40 to 50 years. And then if we stop doing that, we're really going to stop seeing our wildlife. We're, they're already in declines. Um, we know elk populations are down and um, moose populations are also down. If we don't give them habitat, they're gonna, they're gonna keep declining. So um, I think, you know, and then as a climate, from a climate change perspective as well, um, we can't combat climate change, but we can sure do something to help slow it and um, keep these species on the land base as much as possible. Um, I think, you know, it's a wilderness, but it's not wild anymore. We've intervened with things like predator control and burning in the past that we can't just walk away now and hands off and say, no, let's let nature take its course. Um, if we do that, we won't have anything left. So I think it, it is, it's important that um, we use all the tools we can. And I think prescribed burning is one of the most important ones. If we don't have habitat, we don't have animals. It checks all the boxes really, eh? like the, like as for, for providing the quality forage, you know, Absolutely. there's the phenomenon of your, your water retention after post fires and the water table increase. I've seen springs that have been dry for 50 years, you burn and they're flowing all summer long, right? Like. Uh, yeah, lots of great things. And then as we try to incorporate like that local and traditional knowledge into this, I mean, I think, I think in my understanding, you know, fire has been using a tool for a time immemorial, right? 
to what scale we we're, we're not 100 percent sure but trying to understand that better and trying to apply it in a way that uh that will increase uh sustainability i guess yeah yeah, yeah. that was great um thanks for your time um yeah. and uh yeah we'll see everyone at the next update thanks sounds good thanks josh thanks for having me um it's a pleasure to work with such a devoted group of people to wildlife so thank you thank you it's a pleasure okay take